honored to introduce um, for the Center of South Asia Studies the 2013 Regents Lecturer, the noted author, business leader, and public intellectual Gurchan Das. The Regents Lectureship brings prominent leaders, artists, and scholars not based in the Academy to Berkeley for extended visits and is committed to the idea that some of the most important intellectual debates of our time happen outside of the university, as hard as it is for me to imagine that. <laughs> this is the final of a series of public uh, talks that Gurchard Das has given at Berkeley, along with several in the Bay Area. We are honored to have it here at the center. I'm Lawrence Cohn, the director of the center. Um, now, Gurchard Das is no stranger to the academy. His initial training was in philosophy, and he brings to all of his work a close engagement with the major philosophies of liberalism, and perhaps most notably, that of John Rawls. As you may know, Gertrude Das, the philosopher, went on to rise, I think would be fair to say, meteorically in the business world, becoming not only the CEO of Procter & Gamble India, but a leader in transforming the norms of business in India and beyond. Um, Plato wrote to philosopher Keynes, in a capitalist age, Gurcharan may be the equivalent to the philosopher executive. As such, he has been an immensely prolific writer. I will mention but two of his works, both bestsellers. The first is in the Unbound, The Social and Economic Revolution from Independence to the Global Information Age. Widely influential, it established Mr. Das as a leader among that rarefied group of writers distilling the complexities of the contemporary world for large and global popular audiences, the so-called New Pundits. The second book I will mention, however, places Gurcharan far beyond the ranks of the punditry. Entitled The Difficulty of Being Good and the centerpiece of his previous visit to Berkeley, I should thank Professor Goldman for arranging both of these, it reframes the challenges of governance in both the public and private worlds through an examination of classical Indian philosophy and itihas. I could, of course, go on as Mr. Das is also the author of myriad essays and columns, plays, and a novel, and this is just the tip of his iceberg of a biography. Let me just end with this. Amid powerful and in some cases intellectually formidable challenges to liberal governance from the right and from the left, the question of a contemporary Indian liberalism, its sources and its dynamic, its emergent form, and its modes of ethics and of argument remains to be determined. Among the most significant of Indian liberals, as both theorist and practitioner, is our speaker today. And please help me welcome him. Thank you, Lawrence. Uh, <clears throat> Bonita from the South Asia Center yesterday asked me, well, what's it been like being a Regents lecturer? So I thought maybe that would be a good way to begin, because it has been really a, been a privilege uh, to do this. And the whole process began with, uh, believe it or not, talking about the Academy, Ananda Vardhana, who could be more of, from the Academy than he, ninth century critic, great Sanskrit scholar, and in his Dvanya Lok, he says that a good book should confine itself to one Purushartha, one aim of life. And so I figured that I had written a book on Artha, India Unbound, and I had written a book on Dharma, the difficulty of being good. So now it was time for a book on Kama. Oh. And of course, moksha <laughs> is beyond me. <laughs> um, I realized that, I, like many of you, I had read many texts, uh, many books on desire from the Western canon. You know, Shakespeare, uh, Proust, uh, Philip Roth, but I did not know very much about the work in Sanskrit or Prakrit or from the South Asian world. And so I fortunately ran into Bob Goldman 
in Delhi. Now he and Sally, they are really heroes of mine because ever since I read Sundar Kant in the fifth volume of the Ramayana translation in the Princeton University Press series. And so I was delighted to meet them and I told them this thing, this quote from Ananda Vardhana. And that's how the conspiracy was hatched. <laughs> and that's how the idea of coming to Berkeley began. Because I thought it would be very nice to read these texts in the context, in, 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 in a university context, having scholars of Sanskrit around. And so, lo and behold, I came here and we created a reading group, a sort of ginger group, very democratic, Anybody could post readings uh, on the desire reading group. Anybody could come, anybody could go. And, and, and it's been really uh, all I could have wished for, to be able to come and to work on a new book, but with young people meeting on Mondays from four to six, and many of the people are here, I'm happy to see. And, uh, and, 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 and physically, of course, uh, I can only say that uh, Berkeley <laughs> is a bit of paradise, as they say. And, and, and we've been very lucky to have found a magical spot uh, in, a, in, in, in amidst redwood trees on Euclid Avenue, mm -hmm. which looks onto the bay. And so, perfect. Now to come to today's, today's uh, talk, and yes, we will be speaking about liberalism, and many of you do know that the meaning of the word liberal has been, uh, has evolved, to put, it, to put it nicely, but actually has been confused. It's like one of those words, like dharma. <laughs> which leaves everybody confused because the way people use liberal now in America is what we would call in India now a left liberal. And, the cla and I'm talking about the classical liberalism today, the liberalism that gave birth to the modern state. So <clears throat> I think the best way to begin my argument is to talk about two towns on the outskirts of Delhi, Gurgaon and Faridabad. Twenty-five years ago, Faridabad was considered the future. If you were a young person, you were told, go and invest in Faridabad. And Faridabad had rich agriculture, it had an active municipality, it had an industrial estate, investment was pouring in, a direct connection to Delhi. At that time, Gurgaon was a sleepy village, rocky soil, pitiable agriculture, no industry, even the goats ran away. <laughs> Today, Gurgaon 25 years later, has become the engine driver of one of the engine drivers of the new India and of the growth of, of, of new India. It's called the Millennium City with 35 million square feet of commercial space, which houses the world's largest corporations. It has 27 shopping malls, seven golf courses, and thousands of apartment complexes which are world-class. Whereas Faridabad, 25 years later, is still groaning under the weight of red tape and official extortion and has not even experienced the first transformation that came to India after 1991. So what happened? 
Well, Gurgaon's disadvantage turned out to be an advantage. It had no government. In fact, it got its municipality just a few years ago. So no red tape, no extortion, no one to say no to everything that you wanted to do. No one to block development. And it was a story of the self-reliant citizens, the entrepreneurial people who came there. When they had no water, they dug bore wells. When they got no electricity, they put in tra transformers and uh, generators. When teachers did not show up in schools, they set up private schools, even in the slums, which schools which cost $4 a month in fees. When police didn't show up, they got private guards, and so on. Now, the new India is in many ways Gurgaon writ large. It's a story of private success and public failure. And this is why people sometimes ask in India, why do we need a government at all? With corrupt politicians, unresponsive bureaucrats, and they, as they sip chai, they say India grows at night when the government sleeps. I confined the title of my book to the first half of that saying because I thought it would be too insulting to put the second part there. <coughs> so my book is called India Grows at Night. Now to rise without a state is a brave thing, it's courageous. But is it wise or sustainable? And shouldn't India grow during the day? And wouldn't Gurgaon be better off with a functioning drainage system, nice roads, a public transport system, reliable water, parks, sidewalks, libraries. So both corrupt Faridabad and laissez-faire entrepreneurial Gurgaon are the wrong models for India's future governance. Faridabad would be happier with less corruption and Gurgaon would be happier with functioning services, as would the new India. It should not take us 12 years to build a road in India, when it can take three, and in China, where it takes only one year. It should not take us 15 years to get justice in the courts, when it should take three or five at the most. So this is what led me to write this, I, I call it an essay or a pamphlet. I'm like an 18th century pamphleteer. And the essay, as I said, the subtitle of the essay is A Case for a Strong Liberal State. Don't let the word strong put you off. This is the state that was in the eyes of the thinkers, the first liberal thinkers of the state. They realized that a state, the purpose of having a state is to be able to take collective action, decisive action when required. And so, what is a strong liberal state? Essentially, a state with an executive which can take determined, decisive, quick action when required. It has, that action is bound by the rule of law and it is accountable to the people. 
So these are the three pillars of a strong liberal state. Unfortunately, these pillars, unlike the pillars of this building, do not reinforce each other. Very often, they undermine each other. <clears throat> too, much, too much pressure for accountability reduces the ability of the executive to act, which we are seeing today in India with the, after the corruption protests that the there's no Babu in Delhi who's willing to put a signature on a, on, a, on, a, on a piece of paper. And this problem is not an only an Indian problem. You can, you've seen it here in your country, where you would not call Obama a strong president. So there are pressures here. The big problem of the United States is the deficit. They can't solve it. The problem is also in the European democracies, where, how do you pay for the welfare state? They haven't been able to come to grips with that. And in fact, the, the, the Rudolphs are here, so with due respect, let me just say that it's, a, it's, a, it's an indictment also of the discipline of political science, which has been concerned obsessively with the idea of accountability, and not enough with the, with the importance of state capacity. And the problem in India is really that of state capacity because what we need to bring that strong liberal state is precisely the reform of the institutions of governance. The police, the bureaucracy, the judiciary and, and other, other uh, parts of the government. And frankly, the, our present slowdown, economic slowdown, could well be a reflection that we may, that model, that Indian model may have hit a wall. So how are we going to create this strong liberal state in India? And before, before we talk about that, I thought let's pause and ask ourselves, to, you know, what what is happening? What are we in India? And, and, and what? Talk a little bit about the context of India, where you have to do this, these reforms, and why will they? Why is it so difficult? Well, most of you will agree with me that India is a bottom-up success, unlike China, which is a top-down success. Which is to say that India is a success of the people. A success, uh, uh, unlike and, and success from below, and almost despite the state, but China has been orchestrated by an amazing technocratic elite, which has built this incredible infrastructure, and this has given Philip to China. India has produced what India's success is reflected in. 20, today, 25 globally competitive companies. And some of these companies, within five, six years, they want, a few of them will become names that you will know, like Sony that you know, Samsung that you know, globally well-known names. And I have a Chinese friend who visits me sometimes, and he says China would die to have such companies. Uh, he himself invests not in these 25, but the next 25, or in fact the next 50. He's an interesting fellow, by the way. Uh, he doesn't invest in China. He's very rich. He only invests in India. And he made a lot of money in one of the distant provinces of China and then forgot to share it with the party hierarchy in the province. And they found out and he saw that his life was in danger. So he was clever. He spirited out 
250 million dollars out of China and arrived in Hong Kong himself, spirited himself out too. But they, in two, three days they had found him and so he had to again flee and he fled to Vancouver. And when he arrived there, of course, if you have $250 million in your bank, you get residency very quickly in Canada. <laughs> and so he started living in Canada, but within a month they had found him. And so very quietly he drove down in an automobile to California. And of course here as well, if you have that kind of money, you get a green card very quickly. And so he started living in California, but they found him here as well. And finally, he has landed up in Singapore. And it is to the governance levels of Singapore that they dare not touch him in Singapore. Well, he has not been coming to see me recently because I suspect that he thinks I have not been giving him good stock tips. <laughs> but one day he came with a backache and I said, what's happening? And he says, your roads. <laughs> he said, you know, he has been, he had been looking at some factories in Haryana and uh, he says, how did you become the sec second fastest growing economy in the world with this kind of infrastructure? So I told him India grows at night <laughs> and he thought about it and then he said, you mean India has risen with one hand tied and I nodded and he said the nightmare of the Chinese leadership should be what if that second hand got untied one day, meaning what if India really began to grow during the day. The mistake we make is to believe that the race between China and India is economic, who will get rich first and so on. But in fact, both countries will turn into middle class, middle income countries. The race is actually between whether China will fix its politics first or India will fix its governance first. Otherwise both these countries will get stuck in the middle, in what economists call the middle income trap, which is what Latin America, a number of big successful countries in Latin America were stuck in for decades in the last century. The other mistake we make is to believe that the Indian state has become weak only in recent times. Well, the fact is that India has always been a weak state but a strong society. And China has always been a strong state and a weak society. And the fact is you need both. You need a strong state to get things done and you need a strong society to make that state accountable. So the history of India was a, has been a history of kingdoms, competing, warring kingdoms. And the history of China has been a history of empires. And the four empires we had in India, the Mauryas, the Guptas, the Mughal and the British, all four were weaker than the average Chinese Empire. In China, the emperor gave the law and then interpreted the law. In India, Dharma preceded the king and the job of the king was to uphold Dharma for the benefit of the people and the interpreter of Dharma was not the king but the Brahmin. So very early on as early as 6th century BC in the kingdom of Magadha, we had created a liberal division of powers which weakened the state. And so oppression in India, unlike China, oppression came from the state. 
in India, oppression came from society. And the answer to that oppression was the Buddha, the spiritual entrepreneur who came along every few years in the country and who mitigated the oppression of the Brahmins. If the Chinese are assimilators, Indians are accumulators. Which is to say that some of the people who populated China were the same as who populated <coughs> India. They came from Central Asia. And these migrations, in China they assimilated them into one, essentially a majority of them, into one Han identity. In India, we accumulated them into 2,200 jatis, subcastes. And so, that's why we say that India, if China is a soup, India is a biryani, where you can see all the different constituents of the biryani. So it's not surprising that in 1947, India became a democracy and China became a totalitarian state. And so it is not surprising that today India is rising from below and China is rising from above. And the Anna Hazare movement or the protest movements that we are seeing and we will continue to see is a collision between a strong society which is now evolving into a civil society versus a weak state. So given this background, given this context, what is to be done? How do we go about creating a strong liberal state? Well, under the best of circumstances, this is not an easy thing to do. But nations have done it. Britain was corrupt. And we all read in our history books about rotten boroughs and the beginning of the 19th century. Uh, you could buy a seat in parliament, you could buy a job, any job in the government. But the British, they, they did the reforms, the Reform Act of 34, you had then Disraeli and Gladstone who came along, and over a hundred years they created a modern state, a liberal state. And in this century, frankly, uh, I mean in the last century, uh, the, the person, you had uh, Margaret Thatcher, who did this, precisely those kinds of reforms that have made the British state today more accountable. Most of us have this impression that Margaret Thatcher was a pro-market uh, political leader, but she, the impact she had on the state and the reforms that happened as a result of her are reforms we, which we do not appreciate. So if we are lucky, in India, we could get, we, if we had a strong leader who could also be a reformer, well, these kind of reforms I'm talking about, the reforms of governance could take place. But you can't guarantee that in a democracy. We've had a strong leader, we had Indira Gandhi, uh, but she's not the kind of leader we want. She was not a builder of institutions, she was a destroyer of institutions. And some of the problems we face today go back to that kind of strong leader. <clears throat> Frankly, I'm sorry to say, but there is no silver bullet here. And uh, so one has to be humble. Uh, and, and, uh, but for me, the answer to the future lies in the new middle class. India is a young country, half the people below 25. Half of India did not exist before 1991. And so, and they are going to, some of them are going to vote <laughs> in this coming election. And that's why we could be in for some big surprises. Um, 
this new middle class is or the new middle class plus what I call the aspiring people who are aspiring into that middle class. So they're very close to it. That today is about a third of India. But by 2020, it should be half of India or at least in 10 years, 2023, 20, it will be half of India. And I do believe we'll go back to a to a decent economic growth rate because with that which that's necessary for it to for this to happen. Now these people are the ones who've been behind the protests. And they are young, impatient people. And they have tasted success for the first time through their own efforts. And they see the stark contrast between the people who rule the country versus their own lives. And, and so I think these people are searching today for an answer. And, and, uh, and they are also realizing that protests are not enough. Protests can awaken people, but they do not, you need the hard work of politics. And that's why this Aam Admi Party has come up. Now the Aam Admi Party has got a lot of problems with it. Uh, and uh, just at Berkeley a few weeks ago, uh, we had a meeting where, uh, of, uh, sponsored by the IIT and uh, students who are supporting the Aam Admi Party. And I had to tell them, that, look, the Aam Admi Party they don't even believe in the reforms. Their answer to high prices is cut them by half, by fiat. So they want to bring India to, a, to an India of, of, of a pre-1991 period. And that's a very serious problem. So they're very Ill, strong, illiberal tendencies in the Aam Admi Party. But I hope, I mean, they're a good thing. Their history is on their side right now. And it's, it looks like they are making us, they might make a good showing uh, in Delhi. The hard work of politics is what today, and I have this opportunity that I'm, when I'm speaking to you today, I, two or three times a week, I speak in India to, this, to these young people. And they ask, well, what should we do? And frankly, I, or I tell them that the inspiration for me is Tocqueville, the Tocqueville, the, who wrote the best book on democracy, the democracy in America. Mm -hmm. And Tocqueville's insight there, which I present to them, is the idea of neighborhood engagement. I say, don't worry about the corruption of Robert Vadra or 2G scam or what the next big scam of a minister who's caught with a bribe. Worry about corruption in your neighborhood. So the rallying cry is one hour a week. Begin, first of course you must vote, and second, you must begin to spend, begin by spending one hour a week on the neighborhood. And the best idea, frankly, of Kejriwal today is the idea of Mohalla Sabha. Mohalla Sabha is actually the Gram Sabha of the village and, uh, and, and, and in many villages it's, 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 it's working and, and we need to, that, that is the one, the beginning point. So it's hard work, long, hard work begin at the level of neighborhood engagement. The second question the second question that these people wonder at is that they say, what about, you talk about the reforms, but the reforms mean only that the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. Now this idea, of course, resonates in Berkeley as well. And, and this is a failure. Failure of the reformers to sell the reforms, but failure of 
the people who actually created the constitution of the country, the, the, from the constituent assembly on, of their inability to translate the liberal ideals of the constitution into the language of the people. Oops. Thank you. Um, you know, people do not understand the distinction between being pro-market and pro-business. They think it's the same thing. Whereas actually it could be the opposite. Pro-market means you stand for rules-based competition. Competition lowers the, the costs of products. It improves the quality of products. And it helps everybody. <coughs> and leads to a rules-based capitalism with good regulators. Whereas being pro-business stands for a system which retains discretionary authority in the state <coughs> to still hand out licenses like they tried to do in the 2G scam a few years ago. And that system leads to crony capitalism. So most Indians still think basically capitalism is crony capitalism. <coughs> and they are actually the opposite. The, the third problem, which is related to the first problem, uh, which is related to the second one that I just talked about, why liberalism is finding why, why we have to reform by stealth in India? There is not a single candidate, by the way, today, running in this election, who stands, <coughs> who's talking about doing the liberal reforms in the country. Not one. Whether at the state level or at the central level. So reforms are done by stealth. Now, People, the problem of the rule of law in India and corruption partly emanates from, from this, that people, the average person in India felt that in 1950 we became a republic after a constituent assembly of very fine people who had created a fine constitution. But people felt that this constitution kind of fell from the sky one day. And the reason is that this fine constitution has not been sold to the people. The contrast with this country is dramatic. Here, in this country, you're obsessed with your constitution. For 200 so many years, in school, in kindergarten, you start learning about the constitution. And the process of selling is a myth-making process. You create myths. That's what nations are created out of myths. And the last person who tried to do this was Gandhi. Gandhi sold the liberal ideals. He sold many liberal ideals through the language of the people, the language of dharma. He sold the idea of, un of against untouchability. He fought against untouchability, the notion of equality. He fought for freedom from the British, liberty, but using the language of sadharan dharma. Even the constitution makers, the people in the constituent assembly debates, use the word dharma. And they put the wheel of dharma in the flag. The Ashok Chakra is in the flag of the country to remind us that there was a moral purpose in building a country. Unfortunately, Gandhi died. Nehru gave many speeches in the 50s 
But he did not, those did not resonate with the people. The way Gandhi had resonated with the people. And so this is still an un <coughs> incomplete project. The project to sell the liberal ideals of our constitution. And this is the cause of the rule of law and partly the problem of corruption. The answer to corruption is to reduce the discretionary power in the hands of bureaucrats and politicians. That's the liberal answer. Not a super bureaucracy under a Lokpal that the, that the <coughs> Anna Hazare movement was talked about. So these are really this the fact that liberalism and capitalism are finding it difficult to find a comfortable home in India goes back to some of these some of these problems. I had personally hoped that uh, there was a period when we all thought the Congress Party might move a little bit away from the ex towards the middle, away from the left of center, to being too far left to the center, being to the middle, when Narsimha Rao was the Prime Minister. It looked like the BJP during Bajpai's time was going to be a party which might move away from right extreme right to right of center. And the liberal, today, I mean, when I think about liberal position in the US politics, I'm not an expert by any means on US politics, just a lay observer. But to me, the, the persons I would think of voting for would have been somebody like Governor Rockefeller, who was a liberal Republican, or a Democrat who would be perhaps a Clintonian Democrat, or in England it would be a Blair type of uh, Labour leader. Um, I've been critical of our, of where we are. But I do want to put this in, in, a, in a context. This book that I wrote had its origins in Tahrir Square. I was invited by the democracy movement of Egypt to come and speak on uh, the India model for the future of Egypt. And this was Frankly, soon, it was, Mubarak was still around, but he, they had pushed him to Sharm al Sheikh over there. And um, the Egyptians asked me three questions. One, how did you keep the generals out of power? And I said, you know, we haven't asked this question in India for the last 65 years. And they said, you don't know how far you've come if you've never even had to ask this question. Something we take for granted. The second question they asked was, they said that 11% of Egypt is Christian, Coptic Christian, and 13 to 14% of India is Muslim. They said, we believe that the Christians of Egypt are insecure, but the Muslims of India feel more secure. So how did you do that? This again foxed me because I was thinking of Gujarat 2002, I was thinking of the 1984 Sikh riots and I didn't think of us as being a model of secularism but these guys, these people were looking at it this way and again they said, I said this again, I confess to them that I'm surprised and uh, they said again, you don't know 
the Islamic world and they said that the least radicalized, the least fundamentalized Muslims in the world are Indian Muslims. So how did you do it? The third question they asked was, how did you get that outsourcing business? <laughs> so that we too can get it and become a fast moving, fast growing economy. What this made me realize, by the way there is a, a bit of a coda in the sense that uh, uh, on uh, YouTube, I, by, by quite by accident, I actually there was that a huge demonstration broke up just outside our, the, some of you may know the Shepherd Hotel on the Nile next to Tahrir Square where our conference was going on. And that day, a big day, about 30,000 people were in uh, Tahrir Square. And that's how I, because of uh, my host, I landed up having to speak to them for seven minutes with an Arabic translator. And I quickly lost them when I started talking about the most important thing that they needed was the rule of law. Anyway, the, 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 the speech, by the way, is on, is on YouTube. And, 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 uh, but the point here is that I, and I'm closing with this, and we can have a Q&A after that, that the rise of India, the economic rise of India, has been the defining event of my life. I also believe it's good for the world. And at a time when Western <coughs> democracies are filled with their soul searching to whether this is the right model, particularly after the financial crisis, <coughs> a country, a major country is riding, rising on the east based on the liberal principles, the classical principles, both political of political and economic freedom. So, um, <coughs> I think with that, let me, let me close. Uh, I did say to you that uh, uh, India, which does which does provide amazing political and economic liberty, is still finding a hard time to come to economic liberty. But despite that, and that's why in, in my book, I really say that since the BJP and the Congress are incapable of creating this liberal space, that space is empty. And so, and, and this new, the new young people that we are that I'm talking about, the new middle class, these people, frankly, who are searching, because none of the political parties are talking to them. The Congress treats them like, treats everybody like a victim. Oh, you poor fellow, you lost out in liberalization, globalization. So we have to give you free electricity, we have to give you diesel at half price, we have to give you 100 days of jobs, etc. These people don't feel like victims. The BJP treats them like victims. Oh, you are, you've been oppressed for a thousand years by the Muslims. They don't relate to that rhetoric. The caste party also treat them victims of caste oppression. They don't feel that way. So there is an empty space. And I've proposed a liberal party. Now the last thing India needs is another political party. <laughs> and this party, unlike the Aam Admi Party, will not get a lot of votes. But what it will do is it will bring the liberal ideals and the reforms that we need both political, both governance reforms and economic reforms to the front page, which is what liberal parties generally have done in other countries. 
So, just to summarize then, I have said that India needs to grow during the day. Issue in India is state capacity and the reform of our governance institutions. That um, the answer to corruption is not a super bureaucracy like the Lokpal, but the difficult job of the reform of our institutions, reform which will take away discretionary authority from the politicians. The robust answer is one hour a week. The Tocquevillian answer to and the Mohalla Sabas and to return and, and the need to sell the dharma roots of our constitution. All of this is not going to be easy because India is historically a weak state unlike China. Thank you. Yes. Uh, you mentioned that uh, to eradicate corruption, it's important to make the politicians or uh, the people in power to have lesser discretionary uh, authority. Uh, so it's like uh, losing. So people who, who are currently willing to come to power are those who want such authorities to control their wishes or, I mean, based on their wishes of. So it's like, uh, so they aspire to be something and then uh, after that they have to give away that uh, authority. So isn't it a kind of a Contradiction in terms, yes. There are two kinds of corruption. There is what is called harassment corruption, which is what 99% of the citizens face, which is the corruption where you go for a birth certificate or a death certificate or when your father dies, you want a mutation on your land, should come on your name, your property, you have to pay a bribe. That is the most pervasive form of corruption, and that's not what I was talking about. There is the other corruption which occurs through crony capitalism, which occurs because there are no transparent rules, or the state retains discretionary power to give away licenses and favors. That is what I was talking about. Nicholas, I can imagine that India has a structure of a big state. But my question, uh, so my question is, do you think maybe democracy or political freedom is somewhat Oppress the growth of India. For example, if you had a strong leader such as Mao Zedong or someone else, um, would that have improved the growth tra trajectory of the country? Like, had a very strong leader who could sort of be in control and be like, okay, this is the way forward and this is how we have to go now? This is the classical uh, debate, and, and frankly, the debate. Um, well, there are examples. You've had, as I said, Mao Zedong is not the example you should have used. You should have used Deng Xiaoping as a better example, where he created, where they've had 30 years of, an, of a technocratic elite in China, which has lifted mm, hundreds of millions above poverty. Um, <coughs> Singapore had the same. And if China's lucky, it could morph into a giant version of Singapore in the future. Uh, the problem with that is that you cannot guarantee that such a uh, state. There are lots of dictators who are pretty vicious, where you have, don't have high growth either. So it's not a guarantee. The, the other thing is the country, the context, as I said. I don't think India is, is, is India really is almost naturally a democracy. <laughs> you know, uh, being an, uh, being accumulators, uh, I think we 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 veer towards that, and uh, we've we we've uh, even the British were. Um, I mean, this may be sound heretical, but. The British state was not a very, the state in India, the imperial state, was not a very strong state. 
there's a lot of local autonomy below. So um, <clears throat> I'm not sure there is a there, you know that I've answered your question, but certainly my bias would, is in favor of being a democracy. Uh, I'm sure there'd be others who might have mm, far far strong better answers. Yes. Uh, you mentioned that. Sorry. That's fine. One of you can. No, just, okay. <coughs> You referred a little bit to the, in the rural employment guarantee scheme and the you know, schemes like the Food Security Act. I mean, surely they're good in concept. Are you skeptical yes, of the execution? Because yes. you know, the whole development is in concept. Yes. You actually, I just want to hear yeah, you yeah. No, I think that's very good. I mean, I, that's why I, mean, I, 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 I support those kind of programs. But I would support them if there was state capacity to administer them. The way they are administered today, it's being lunatic. You know, more than half the money is wasted. And, and surely this is hard-earned money of the people. And to see it wasted. Now, with, with there, are, there are positive things, particularly with the Adhar scheme. There, is, there are possibilities of a better way of administering that. But the fundamental, uh, I wrote a column uh, in the Times of India last month, uh, my Sunday column, and uh, in which I talked about the fact that th 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 this particular election, 2014, actually presents us with the classical right of center, left of center appeal. The voters can actually <coughs> choose. The, the fact is that the, uh, the Congress party is very clearly committed to redistribution, and the the rhetoric of Narendra Modi as head of BJP is very clearly committed to doing growth. This is in some ways echoed by Bhagwati and Sen as well, uh, a sort of a simplified version or an oversimplified version of Bhagwati and Sen. And so Indian voters will get a chance now to vote for two different models, one which says uh, that you have to have growth, and with growth, you get resources for redistribution. And the other sense, the others is that if you spend money on health, education, etc., and on, 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 on welfare, you'll get a more uh, competent workforce, a healthy workforce, which will then lead to higher growth. So, uh, these are two very real debates, and the Indian voter will have a choice to to decide on those on those uh, debates. But will one side's victory wipe out the other? So, for example, sorry, supposing supposing the BJP wins, then yeah. will the schemes just go away, not be defunded? Will that? Well, you know, I think the, I'm not sure because BJP is also quite a populist party. Yeah. So they would be very scared to disband the schemes. And I hope the effort here should be to make these schemes efficient. Uh, but clearly, uh, half-price diesel, free electricity, these are the kinds of things that have to go away. People have to pay. Electricity is not free. Why should farmers get free electricity? So those are the things which there are serious problems uh, in, 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 uh, in, in the model. The answer, I mean, in fact, you need both. I mean, you need good schools, you need good healthcare centers. But today, one out of four school teachers doesn't show up in a primary school. Two out of five doctors do not show up at a primary health center, government funded. One out of three nurses does not show up at a primary health center. That's the problem. So we debate the what, and the answer is, we should be debating, the answer is in the how. Yes, sir. So one of the prerequisites for a strong state, for a state that has the capacity to deliver on its various services, etc., is that the state needs to have resources. Now, as you know, India has one of the lowest uh, shares of tax revenues of any country on the planet as a share of the total overall GDP. 
even the U.S. forget about the yeah no no I I know the argument you're going to so it is right India's share of taxes is it's not the lowest by the way but it's low but frankly if you read the literature of the economists they will tell you that at at this stage of development most countries had this ratio that once your per capita income crosses twenty thousand dollars then you have a different stage of development so it's the usual argument oh but indians don't pay taxes that is frankly uh, not correct not correct well they do not they don't pay their taxes but frankly <coughs> the compliance uh, will not make the big difference here but that's not what i was going to say yes i'm yes. not saying that indians don't pay taxes i'm saying that a lot of this is done in order to placate our upper middle classes we are one of the few countries in the world which does not have a long term capital gains tax for example and to give you an it, it, what it does is that that kind of a thing further undermines the strong state that you are speaking for i am actually very happy that somebody like you comes and says that we need a strong state yeah unfortunately I'll give you an example. We just got organized a conference from Berkeley in India, and there was one gentleman who said we should all privatize our airports. So somebody says, "Oh, you mean you want to have efficient airports like in the United States?" And everybody around, all the Indians, and we were super well-known Indians, including economists, and they said, "Yes, yes, like in the U.S." I said, "You know that not a single airport in the U.S. is in private hands." <laughs> Okay, I think this is. I, I think we, you made your point. You made your point, and the answer, some of the answers to your to your concerns, are the the fact that the resources you're talking about. You began with the question of resources. My own belief is that the resources come through growth, fundamentally. why india has changed from before 91 to today is because this of growth the state has been able to command here a lot of resources now we all wish that these resources were well spent that is part of the problem um one of the serious one of the reasons why i feel a sense of betrayal today by this government is that they inherited a very strong economy and that economy was went into a state where we had uh, i'll give you four numbers four numbers the first it's it is 1 three and a half six and eight these capture these four numbers capture 100 years of india's economic growth for the first this is 100 years so the first 50 years of the 20th century india grew at 1% and the population also grew at 1% so that's why we call our our economy during colonial period as a stagnant economy after independence from 50 to 1980 the economic growth rate went up to 3.5% but population growth also went up to 2.2% so the result was 2 3.5 minus 2.2 is 2.1.3 and that's what we call the hindu rate of growth of course it had nothing to do with being hindu it was the license raj nehruvian model rate of growth that we experienced but then from the mid 80s the picture changed and that 3.5% quickly in the 80s went to 5.6 in the 90s went to 6.3 so that the average from say the 2002 was the 6% rate of growth when the population growth rate was begin to slow down to about 2% the last decade the growth rate has been close to 8% 7.9 8% 
where the population has come down to 1.4%, population growth rate, 1.4. So this is a very significant jump in growth rate. Well, that's the economy that this government inherited. And they assumed that growth was our birthright. High growth was something that was on automatic, would automatically take place. And that, the drop in the growth rate from five years of almost 9% down to four and a half, half, has been a great tragedy. And three-fourths of that tragedy is, is, is self-inflicted, meaning maybe a quarter depends on the global economy. There are many factors, but the global economy has also contributed to it. But the fact of the matter, why we are suffering today, and you know, these are not statistics. I'm giving a lot of numbers, but the fact is 1% growth rate means 1.5 million jobs. 1.5 direct jobs, and each job creates three indirect jobs, which means 6 million jobs. And each job supports five people. So 30 million people per 1% growth rate. And you drop it from nine to four and a half. And you can see you've hurt 120 million people. And frankly, this kind of pain, and the reason it's self-inflicted partly is because they took their eyes off the ball. A thousand projects, thousand projects got stuck because nobody was clearing them in the, in the, in the, in the, in the government. And so it's very hard to exonerate. It's very hard to exonerate this government. Yes. Thank you for this wonderful talk. I have a question about the judiciary in India, which at least at the Supreme Court level. You're a lawyer. I am a lawyer, okay. yes, I admit. <laughs> has been a, quite an activist judiciary, and your sleep analogy made me think of, in particular, the PIL mechanism, which um, what Justice actually described to me as the alarm calls of the other branches of government, telling them, no, don't sleep, please get up. Now, obviously, this vehicle has, has had many limitations and many critiques to be made, but I was wondering what you see as the role of the courts in this process of bringing about the world reform on the yeah. smaller state. You know, a lot of us are sympathetic to many of the PILs, public interest litigations, because they are in the right, in the right, mm -hmm. doing the right thing. But a lot of the problems have been created by an, act, an excessively active judiciary. For example, the, a, a blanket ban on mining has hurt millions of people. So it's not distinguished between legal and illegal mining. Just because the executive was corrupt, they said blanket ban. And there are other examples. Even the 2G, the answer to 2G, the banning of, of Telenor and all these, these companies. These were international companies who had got licenses which had the signature of the government of India on them. So, um, I don't think there's a black and white answer. We would all like the judiciary to do the job of the judiciary. And frankly, the, answer, the question to ask every Chief Justice of India is, why can't we get a court or judgment in five years or three years? That's the real issue, isn't it? Lord. So uh, we've been, you, we were, you've been talking about India as a uh, unity or one thing, or whereas it is a federal system and there is a, and there is a lot of difference among the states yes. with respect to their economies and their politics. And many of these you're talking about would look quite different if you went state by state. And uh, correct. And so India is uh, something I think <coughs> misleading to think about India as an economy uh, uh, homogeneous or not homogeneous but as one thing whereas if you start looking at India state by state you get a very different set of problems and a lot of different solutions and better more success and less success and so forth. Yeah, no I think that's very correct uh, and in fact uh, we've had a, just as you've had in this country a new federalism we too have experienced uh, federalism. The and, and I think many of us applaud power devolving down. We are returning back in some ways to
to the kingdom, the, the model of, of a country with kingdoms. Obviously, now we don't worry so much whether the center will survive. I think, and we can talk, we can talk more confidently uh, of, of federalism. And you're absolutely right, Lloyd, that uh, some of the reforms which we talk about are really needed in the states. It's the projects that are so many projects are stuck in the states, uh, and 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 and, and uh, so, and why stop with the states? You need more power to go down to the villages, to the municipalities. One of the problems with urban India is that we don't have a good governance structure for our cities. They don't have enough financial independence the way cities do in this country. And uh, 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 the states are not willing to give up power to the, to the cities. And and, 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 and and so that I think is is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a very good, well valid point. So two, two questions. One, to what extent is this, not in theory, but in this moment, is the strong executive you're calling for tied to Hindutva? And uh, the other, I don't mean in general, but I mean at this moment. And, and what are the implications of that if so, or if perhaps it's not so? And the other question, very different, is I'm very intrigued by the idea of Gandhi as a font of liberal thought. It doesn't come naturally to me, so I wonder if you could say more about that. Right, right. Well, both very good points. Um, the, in fact, uh, to continue the point that Lloyd had raised, that uh, some of our state chief ministers are like presidents of countries. So we don't have the problem that our prime minister uh, uh, is, 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 is facing today. Uh, and actually, what we need there is a, uh, some control on some of these, uh, some of these uh, chief, chief, chief ministers' uh, liberal controls. Now, I take it your question about uh, Hindutva was more Modi. And, and, uh, and, 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 and it is true that a lot of people feel that sense of uh, the terrible betrayal that many people feel about by this government. And, uh, and, 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 and like there is a desire to have a strong leader uh, in such a circumstances because this has been one of our weakest prime ministers that we've, 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 we've had. So you have a natural and that partly explains why Modi is ahead in the polls um, uh, going up to 2014. Um, <clears throat> Modi, as I wrote in a column I wrote in, as I, uh, I wrote a column in the Financial Times about the liberal dilemma, uh, the dilemma that a ordinary Indian voter faces today. And we do have two different leaders, Rahul Gandhi and Modi, who <coughs> represent very different ideologies, very different ex ex executive styles, uh, management styles. And uh, my own view is that Modi is probably the best chance today to get back to 7-8% growth rate in the country. And therefore, those of us who crave for that demographic dividend rather than the demographic disaster would certainly f vote for Modi. Modi is also the best chance to get some cleanup and of having not corrupt free governance, but certainly less corrupt governance. Um, certainly in Gujarat, why a lot of investment keeps pouring in is partly because the, it's, it's, the, you don't have uh, the, 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 the boiler inspector, the labor inspector, the, uh, the sales tax inspector, all these a dozen or so inspectors are, are, are not uh, are too scared to, to uh, 
ask for bribes. Um, and so there will be, I think he will, he will make a difference to corruption. This, and this will be through sheer, sheer sort of <coughs> giving. Also, I think that if bureauc the, just as the Gujarat bureaucracy has, uh, is, is, is performs well because he has given a sense of purpose. So I don't think he's a liberal, strong leader that one I was talking about. He's not a reformer of institutions. But he will give you these positives. The negative side of Modi is that he's communal. And so the question arises, it's a clash of values. If you, you can't have the perfect leader, if you are a committed secularist, you won't vote for Modi. But if you believe that Gujarat 2002 won't get repeated, you'll take a chance on that, but you want high growth, you want corruption to be, you'll vote for, you will vote for him. And that's why the today, it's a very stark, it's pretty stark, the choice. And that's what we will see. Now, it's, it's each voter will finally decide. I personally don't think that there are people who say, well, oh, India could become like Nazi Germany. Yeah. I think the Weimar Republic was a different in thing than India is. I mean, some of the historians here will, uh, uh, should, should, should perhaps tell us this, but my reading of history is that the conditions that brought about Hitler were very, very different. And uh, I think we have built a more robust democracy. And of course, it did, this democracy was subverted by Indira Gandhi. So we have to always be watchful. So then, don't, don't, isn't there a danger of Modi becoming at least an Indira Gandhi, not a Hitler? Yeah. Well, if you see, well, yeah, if you see the uh, record in Gujarat, I don't think that he has subverted the constitution in Gujarat. I don't think that. Uh, if you see the record of the last 10 years, um, it's not a record of an, creating an emergency type of situation where liberties have been suspended uh, in, the, in the country. But there's fear, a lot of fear, like, in command's fear. Well, you know, you, this is, it's, 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 uh, it's, 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 you get both sides. A lot of people say that Muslims vote for him in Gujarat, that uh, a lot of Muslim groups have come out in favor of him. So it's not clear mm -hmm. what the situation. But you know, for the voter, I believe, you have now a, a choice between two different, two very clear alternatives, <coughs> both a right of center economic policy and left of center <coughs> economic policy and other styles of the styles. Of yes? So I thought there's a pretty serious charge against Modi for stalking a woman and revealing her right to privacy. And I was just curious if you think this could significantly impact his chances for I don't know about this case. I've been here at Berkeley. I'm afraid I haven't uh, been reading about that. You had a question. Yeah. So uh, you were talking about uh, institutional reforms and with regards to accountability I wanted isn't it a problem of accountability as well or is it just a problem of state capacity as you mentioned? Well you know it's very interesting that India is a case where if you are poor what you experience is a strong state. If you're rich you experience a weak state. So yes there always has to be a concern with accountability and certainly the Right to Information Act and all these things have been steps in the right direction. Um, but 
by and large, if you told me today, what if I had to choose, I would choose for enhancing state capacity. And that's, I think, would be my answer. Mm -hmm. We time for one more question. Yes. How about your Gandhi question? You haven't answered this liberal Gandhi question. Ah, yes, yes. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. I, uh, uh, you know, Gandhi is such a complex <laughs> figure that we can spend the whole evening, and there are so many Gandhian experts here uh, in the audience, including the Rudolphs, that um, I, I, I basically picked on the liberal side of Gandhi, which he, the ideas that he probably acquired in his stay in England and South Africa and his um, and, and clearly the, when he fought the, when he fought against the stab Hindu establishment in India, after all he was murdered by the somebody who was close to the RSS. Um, so they were pretty upset with him. And, and uh, what, what struck me about Gandhi, frankly, his success was that he was a myth maker. N and nation building is a process of myth making. And what he had taken, done, was the notion of Dharma, the same notion that the Buddha took and Ashoka took, which is Sadharan Dharma and not Swadharma, the universal Dharma, I think are Although he did not, very cleverly, he did not articulate it that way, but his, his discourse was a discourse that resonated with the people. And uh, so, to me, politically, he was on the liberal side. Uh, now, he had a lot of other crazy ideas, as we know. I mean, his economic ideas were, were totally... His, the idea of self-sufficient villages, Ambedkar said that village is a den of iniquity, so immediately <laughs> he uh, destroyed that idea, and the Swadeshi idea, uh, clearly these are not uh, viable ideas any, anymore. Uh, I'm not sure, maybe we can have a big talk over lunch and you can sort of enlighten me on this, but that's the thing. Yes. You, you've been, you, you had another point. So, according to a recent year report which came out, it said that India has displaced and recruited most number of people in the world, mostly farmers and indigenous people, that number is 16 million people, since India's independence to make way for various development projects like dams and infrastructure projects. So the question that I had was, how do you contextualize economic liberty um, in the face of deepening social inequities? Um, also, for example, this travel state of Jharkhand, which has made way for tremendous industrialization, um, including fuel growth for the biggest corporation in India, one of the biggest, which is the Tatas, but you also have 20 million tribals who have been displaced. So how do we sort of sustain that growth at this tremendous price especially as we also head towards a pretty significant environmental and climate crisis? Well, uh, in some ways China has, is facing this, the, 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 same, the same issue. And the reality is that about the Chinese state has lifted about 380 to 400 million people above the poverty line. Now, India's record is not as good as China's. India, according to Tendulkar, who is probably the best expert on poverty in India, he's no, no longer alive, uh, but he claimed that from 1985 to 2005, India had lifted, had been, 1% of the people had been crossing the poverty line every year. And that total amounted to about 250 million people which would today be close to 300 million. The latest numbers of the, the, from the Planning Commission report, the latest report on poverty, shows that actually this trend accelerated. 
So you lifted even more people. Um, you're lifting, in the last the period of high growth, you were lifting 2% per year uh, to the poverty line. So I refuse to accept this fact that the, uh, yes, inequalities may be growing, but I think at this point we should be looking at people who are crossing the poverty line and who are moving upwards. And, and, and so from that point of view, I think the best, the only way we know to do that is growth. China has realized it, India has realized it. Mao's answer is not the right answer. 